you would, turn in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. Uh, we'll be in there today. It's, it's an interesting chapter. I think a lot of things can be overlooked in it if we're not careful. But Exodus 20, we're just going to deal with the first 11 verses because there is so much to digest. And if you found that, if you would, bow your head and your hearts and let's go to the Lord. Father, we thank you once again for allowing us all to come together and meet. Lord, we thank you we live in a country where it's actually safe to do so. We thank you for that. And Father, we just ask for your anointing, the power of your Holy Spirit, and what is said, what is heard. We process it, Lord, to soften our hearts, to hear what you have to say, Lord. We, we trust that um, all the worship so far, Lord God, is, has been sent up to you and has been a sweet savor to your nostrils, Lord, as we do enjoy the time we have to praise you together. And we just ask for your presence here among us as we go through your word now, Father. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You know, Tony was mentioning memorials. In Germany, there's a memorial for a man who was loved by an entire people. Probably most of y'all have seen the movie Schindler's List. And Schindler, played by Liam Neeson in the movie, it's a true story, was a man who saw what was going on how the Jews were being rounded up and, and hauled off to the death camps and all this. And he, being a, a German uh, machine or businessman, uh, just couldn't stand to see this happening. And so he came up with this way to save as many as he could. Of course, he couldn't save everyone. But um, what he did was he, he contracted to the Nazis to build ammunition. But in order to do that, he needed, and, and to, to make the the cost point, the, pro, uh, the cost point, made to in order to get the contract, he needed what he called free labor, and so he he offered this to the Nazis and said, "Look, let me have some Jews, gypsies, other people that they were throwing away and killing." He said, "And and I, we will produce your ammunition," and so he was going and getting all these people who would have been sent off to the death camps, and he employed them. And even the children, they were thinking, what do you need with all these little kids? What do kids know about machining? You know, building cartridge cases and shells and all that. And he said, well, their fingers are small. They can get inside and polish the shells. And so, and then he got caught because he had blind people working for him. Anybody that was deemed an undesirable by the Nazis, and that was a large category, a large uh, criteria there, um, he took in. And he saved, I don't know what the number is, it shows at the end of the movie, I hadn't seen the movie in a while, but it shows the number of people that were saved, were still alive at the end of World War II. He paid the ultimate price eventually. But the people that were saved because of it, and they built a memorial, and they, and they did this because they wanted to remember someone who literally delivered them from the hand of the enemy, someone who who wanted them dead, who wanted them killed, for no other reason than their ethnicity ethnicity, or, or other different categories they had. And this man saw what was happening, and he intervened. We're going to see something like that today, in a sense. And I bring that up because of how lightly. You see, this is one thing about memorials. They always seem to mean the most to the first generation. The people that were there when whatever transpired, whenever that the moral, memorial represents transpired. So say to the Vietnam Memorial, that, se that means the most to people who lost people in Vietnam and that sort of thing. Because they were there, they tasted it, they felt it, and it really impacted their life. Generations removed, you remember the history of it. But unless you had a grandfather or father, somebody that was killed in Vietnam, it just doesn't hit you as hard. Same thing with 9-11. We all remember that. I remember where I was. I remember a, a lady called me that morning. I was driving a truck at the time. I'd gotten in very late the night before, and I was actually asleep. And Rochelle calls, and I'm like, and that's before cell phones and all this, for us anyway. And I'm like, what do, you, what do you want? It's 9 o'clock in the morning. I've had like five hours sleep. She said, turn on the television. I said, Rochelle, what are you doing? And this is a family friend. She said, turn, and she called me by my first full name. 
Everett turn on the television, which she and my wife and my mother still do that day when I'm in trouble. When she's emphasizing a point, her husband at the time, we were in ministry school together, she said, Everett, turn on the TV and sit, look at what happened. <sighs> okay, whatever. So I get up. I think I had to go up to the front. I don't know if we even had a TV in the bedroom back then. Turn it on, and there are the Twin Towers. And I remember it just kind of taking my breath away. And I remember my thoughts after that. And I remember all the guys. Uh, I was a contractor for the military at the time. I remember everybody being deployed and what all was being said. And I won't even repeat all that. But the point is, as hard as it hit me, it will never hit me as hard as someone who had a loved one who died in the towers or one of the plane crashes in the Pentagon or, or the one that landed in uh, was Pennsylvania or what have you. It'll never hit me that same way. As bad as it hits me, and I'm a patriot, and boy, I'm like, if I wasn't too old, give me a gun, and I'll, I'll do what I can. That was what was in my mind. Once again, the point being, unless what you have been delivered from, unless the thing the memorial recognizes really touches you, then it, you run the danger and you see this with each succeed, successive generation that whatever the memorial, the statue, the whatever, it just kind of fades. That is a danger. Same thing with the communion. It can become ritual. It be, can become just what we do. This is the south where I grew up. Everybody goes to church. That's what you do. Now that's a lot of tradition. I'm not saying this the most... It's not certainly not the best way to be, but that's just the way it is. You go to church. Everybody. I remember the first time I ever find, found somebody that didn't go to church. My fifth grade teacher sitting there at lunch. Where do you go to church, Miss Thompson? I don't go. I remember all us kids are just... <laughs> we're sitting at this little table. She doesn't go to church. You know, and, and as fifth grade kids, what do you do with that? It just blew our mind because we didn't know anybody. It didn't go. But it can very quickly become just something you do. It can become routine. So you run two, two risks at opposite ends of the, of the pendulum swing there. Either it becomes you become so familiar with it that it loses its meaning, or you begin to forget and it loses its meaning. And we don't want either one of those things to happen. So we've now got to this point. I want to bring up another character. It was a show that I didn't watch a lot, but there was one guy that was real funny. In the show Seinfeld, he always had this nut job that would open a door and just kind of bust in. I think it was a Kramer, you know. He'd always, hey, oh, in your face. And he would just jump in to the room and, hey, let's go do this thing. All of a sudden, everybody's standing there. Like, what are you talking about? Three seconds ago, we were having a quiet conversation. I don't know if you've ever had anybody that just busts onto the scene and then sort of, demand something of you for which you have no context. Well, today we get into the story in Exodus 20 where we actually have a story within a story. If you're reading the book of Exodus, you go from what we talked about last week in Exodus chapter 19 to what's known in theological circles as a storm theophany. This is a manifestation of God, theos, theophany. And he's at the top of this mountain. To the pagans, it's a storm god thing. And when we get to the golden calf, that'll really start to make sense to you. But at this point, the mountain is quaking. There's fire and lightning and all this. And, and Moses is up and down the mountain talking. And then as you read, you hit Exodus 20, and all of a sudden, boom, you got the ten, what we call the Ten Commandments. And it's really kind of it's, it's interrupting the story if you're really looking at the story. But that's the way God structured it. So now all of a sudden we've hit this thing, this, the Decalogue is what it's technically called. And we get to verse 1. We've kind of got the story within the story. And verse 1 says, And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. So verses 1 and 2 are the foundation upon everything, uh, are the foundation upon which the rest of the chapter actually rests. And if you're paying attention, 
There's a progression here. We need to, to understand that. Because in verse one, verses 1 and 2, God makes a foundational statement. And He's laying the ground rules for why everything that comes after that is actually coming about. And He says here, Because I am the God who has delivered you, you my people Israel, out of bondage. Because of all that. Because of this, I'm making a covenant with you, um, the people whom I have delivered. They are specifically His people. He is speaking specifically to them at this time. They are His family. They would have seen this as they've come through the Red Sea to an ancient uh, anybody in the ancient Mesopotamian world, but to the Israelites especially. They are now a new creation that God has brought through the waters of chaos. That's the way, the way they would have seen this. And now God has he's got His people. He's delivered them. He's got them in one place. He's now codifying, um, setting up. I'm trying to think of the best definition for that. Making official um, what it is actually like to be His people because they will be different. They're supposed to be different. Israel as a nation and as individuals, they are to exemplify the traits, the characteristics, and actually the very holiness of God. And they are, to, are they supposed to do this well. Of course, as we see, they don't do it well, and neither do we most of the time or a good deal of the time. Therefore, in order, because you've got to understand, this is new to them. They didn't, weren't just born knowing all this. Subsequent generations, yes, it would have been already been placed from the time they were born all the way through the, the, their childhoods. This would have been put in their heads. It would have been ingrained in them. It is their culture. It's the water in which they swim. But this is new for this group. They've just been, been delivered out of bondage. They always knew who Yahweh was. But now it's kind of becoming official as to what all this is. And in order to learn, in order that they learn who God is and what He is like, He gives them what we know as the Ten Commandments. Actually, the Hebrew is the Hebrew wording is the Ten Words. The word commandment doesn't actually come till later, but that's the way we know it. And they're basic building blocks. Oh, they're not the entirety of the law, but they're basic building blocks on which to construct an idea and a worldview. And they're also clues as to just who God is and how He is so different from His creation. Because He is so uh, beyond His creation, there's no way, there is no way to get a total grasp of who He is and what He is like other than this special revelation, this theophany of God coming down to the mountain and communicating with them. Sometimes through Moses, sometimes you read it, that He's speaking to them with this booming voice from the mountain, what have you. But it's a special revelation. Natural theology, is, which is basically what you can learn about God from looking around in creation. I would argue that this is what the sciences are supposed to do. Natural theology can only take you so far. And we'll get to why that is later. So, at this point, God begins with the fact that He, and this is what you've got to understand, otherwise you're just reading a bunch of rules, is that He and He alone has delivered Israel from bondage, and because they are His people who are now free from bondage, there's a standard and a, now a responsibility that must be met because they have a purpose in being His people. It's not like we've been delivering all... Hey, there you go. Cool, dude. Appreciate it. We got life. It's not like that at all. There's a responsibility. There's standards because their vocation, their purpose for being delivered, hear this, their purpose for being delivered is to reflect God's holiness to those around them. In their case, the pagan nation. In our case, Atlanta or the surrounding area. Verse 3 says this, and this builds on that foundational statement, because I've delivered you, verse 3. You shall have no other gods before me. Little g, all right? That's, the word is Elohim. I'm not going to get into the Hebrew there, but it's a little g gods. Because I've delivered you, because I have destroyed, if you're familiar with the story, what he did in Egypt, 
destroying the whole world of these pagan gods, the Hebrew word, excuse me, the Egyptian word is the ma'at, M-A-A-T. I didn't write here. I don't, I don't know Hebrew. They just, just the way they spelled it. The ma'at, which is the order and the pantheon of the gods and all their structure, God comes in, the one true God comes in and wipes that out, showing the Israelites and the Egyptians and by word of mouth, everybody else in the region, you can have all your little gods all you want, but there's only one sheriff around here and I can whoop them all because I am the only uncreated creator. Now he says, you shall have no other gods before me. And God doesn't deny the existence of these other little G gods, okay? They're not just statues. The word technically means spiritual beings. They are created. They're not angels. Think of them as higher than angels. But they are spiritual beings. And God speaks with them like you're speaking at a board meeting in the book of Job and other places. He talks about this, all right? That's another thing altogether. But what he's doing here is he said even all these little, even these spiritual powers and you want to call them demons, whatever you want to call for the time being, that's fine. He said it doesn't matter how powerful they are. I made all of them. And like I said last week, what Daddy always told me, I brought you into this world. I can take you out. And God has taken them out in, the, in Egypt. That's exactly what he did. And he, the reason he can do this is, is this very thing is that God, Yahweh, is the only uncreated creator. He had no cause. Nobody caused God. He always has been. Therefore, by definition, He is God. Any other power, other than Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, no matter how powerful in the, in the angelic, in the spiritual world, He created them. So He is above them. He is the only, he is the only true God, capital G in that sense, He's demonstrated in the creation of the world that He's able to do this. In the cre creation account of Genesis, also with the destruction of Egypt, and now by bringing Israel through the Red Sea, He's now manifesting Himself on top of this quaking, heaving mountain. And because of all this, there are none who can stand before Him, and there are none who are worthy of worship. And Israel is different from all the pagan nations in this sense. They get to see it. The other nations are still worshiping all those pagan gods. But he's saying, look, when it comes down to it, there's only one that has all the power, and that's me. And I've delivered you, destroying their gods. And because I've delivered you, therefore, you can put a therefore between the commandments, you shall have no other Elohim, little g gods before me. I'm the only one. I mean, if you're gonna if you're gonna bow down to somebody, why not go to the top of the heap? Why go to the mid-level management? You go straight to the CEO, and that's what he's telling them here. And God is not, and this is what I want you to understand: that God is not just busting in on the scene like Kramer and, and, and manically saying stuff. He told them the reason I'm laying this on you, the reason I'm putting this out there, is because. I am the one that delivers you. I am the only uncaused cause. I am the only uncreated creator. There's no one above me. So any other thing between humans and me, he said, you don't have to fool with that. It comes down to me because I, only I have the power. He's not just busting on the scene and arbitrarily saying, hey, y'all worship me. The pagan gods do that. He's not saying that. He has proven himself to be the only one worthy of worship. Look at verse 4. He goes on, and he put another, uh, therefore, you shall have no other gods before me. Therefore, verse 4, you shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. So therefore, because I delivered you, therefore you shall have no other gods before me. Therefore, all of this, because he's the only one that is to be worshipped, 
And because of the way he sets it up in the Bible, it's actually a very logical statement. If you know the laws of logic, there's no way to argue with it. The Israelites, because of this, he's saying, and because they're supposed to be so different from everyone else, he says, you are to make no graven or carved images for worship of anything in the heavens, very important, the earth, and under the earth. Now, that rings true. That statement, heavens, earth, and under the earth, means a lot to them because that's, what's their, that's their cosmology. This is the way the people in the ancient Near East saw it. There are the heavens above the firmament, and the stars were seen to be as gods, representing this where you get all that zodiac stuff. And they're in that dome, and then you have the earth, and in their minds, there's the earth that's held up actually by pillars, and the underworld has water in it, chaos. And God, in Genesis 1, brought order out of that chaos and created everything. Now, if you study different cultures, you'll see this. All the way over to the Maya in, the, in the, uh, South America. They are the, the city Chichen Itza. I've actually been there. That means those people are the people of the well. That's what that means. And any place you had this large sinkhole with water or cave is the underworld. The Egyptians did something very similar. And it all ties back to this three-tiered cosmology. What does that have to do with anything? I'm trying to show you the cohesiveness of the Bible and what you see around what we see around us. But they have this three-tiered thing. That's what is represented there. And the pagans had these gods uh, um, who were worshipped as images, and they looked like things of this earth. Cattle, cows, be a snake. It could be a cat. It could be anything, any sort of animal, or even a person. Or sometimes there are these weird things, like in Greek mythology, a minotaur or something. You know, now you've got this thing, a motor. Y'all seen that commercial? Where a guy's half man and half motorcycle? Well, the minotaur is half man and half bull. You know, something weird like that. And the Hebrew is really pretty neat when you start checking that kind of stuff out. But this goes back to what I was talking about a natural, of natural theology. The pagans, all they had was natural theology. Now, they believed in supernatural things, all right? They believed in supernatural things. But when it comes to trying to put a face on their gods, little g-gods, or represent them, all they can do is relate him or her or them to something they can see, which is totally different from what's going on here with Israel because they have to rely on natural theology because they're making this stuff up as they go along. But the one true God, he, what he says is actually the opposite. You don't make any graven image of me. Unfortunately, in certain branches of Christianity, that's what they do. You've got statues of folks and saints all over the place, and everybody's doing this and, and burning candles and all that sort of thing. And this is exactly aimed at not doing that. And here's the reason. And I know what they'll say. We're not really worshiping them. We're just paying homage. It just says don't bow down to them. It's the same thing. You can play the semantic games all you want. But it's a, in di uh, direct violation of what's, what's being said here. And here's the reason God says that. And he's saying your natural theology, though you can learn things and tra about the traits of God, it will never bring you to who I really am. It's good. I like the study of it. But it will never, you cannot describe me. You cannot make an image. You can't take a picture. You can't carve anything. You can't paint anything that will ever bring you to who I really am. And because of that, any image or whatever you make is always going to be demeaning. It's always going to be shy of the real thing. Let me give you a for instance. We all got cars. We've seen cars. We drive cars. We ride in cars. They didn't create themselves. A bunch of engineers got together and designed that thing down to every little bolt, every measurement, how much voltage goes through this wire and everything else. Now, you see the car. Does that tell you what the engineers look like? No. The engineers are so much above the creation. The car can't design an engineer, but the engineers can design the car. The car can do a lot of things but it can only do what it's told to do. What I'm getting at is if you think of the car as the creation, you can't ever just walk up on a car. 
if we none of us had ever seen one before, you know, Mad Max uh, scenario, and no, all the generations have forgotten after the nuclear holocaust or whatever in the, is in the movie, you ever sudden we walk up and there is a Mustang sitting there. I'm like, wow, what is that? You can see the young kids. You kids now, they don't know who Elvis is. So it's not a big jump to think that some people eventually won't know what a car is. I mean, I just don't know. How do you not know who Elvis is? I don't get it. But anyway, somebody comes along, and there's this old Mustang sitting there. Like, wow, what is this thing? Wow, sit in it, and it's got knobs and buttons. And, and the, the, the Mustang survives because it's a Ford. All the Chevys are already gone. <laughs> but, um, and you sit in it, and you, wait, what's under here? And, oh, there's, what is that thing? I don't know. Is that what they call a motor? What is that? What, you know, and so you can figure all this, and you can see that somebody had to build it, but it doesn't tell you anything about the engineers or even the people that put it together on the assembly line. There's only so much you can glean from that. I mean, so they say, psychologists say, there's a lot to be said about what you drive. You know, you've got some people driving station wagons and minivans, and that tells you, or they probably got kids, their soccer mom and hauling folks around, not all the time, but sometimes. Or you got, you know, a Ferrari or something. Well, you know, they're not hauling kids around in that. There's a 60-year-old guy, middle-aged crazy, trying to prove he still can, is the way Jerry Lee Lewis sang the song. Um, you know, driving that, not necessarily. I'm, I'm having fun. But you get the picture. That, that you can learn something about the, the person from by what they drive. You can do it by what I drive. You can look at that. It's an old car. Don't laugh at my car, honey. My car is a hot rod Lincoln. It's old, like me. It's 30 years old. But it's got a Mustang GT engine in it. <laughs> Factory shorty headers, double roller cam, high output 5.0 with air ride. Two door, not a four door. It's not the big box. And I'll have you know it can still get up and go. So you can, you can turn that. What do you think? What, what does that tell you? I'm an older guy who likes older cars, but I still got a little bit of <clears throat> in me. Not a whole lot, not as much as I used to, but I still got a little of that in me. And I like that brand of car. I like Fords. All right? So you can learn that much, but it doesn't tell you everything about me. You know, and I'm not going to tell you what my wife thinks that car represents. <laughs> but I could have sold it 30 times over at red lights and gas stations. So some people like my car. honey. She won't ride in it, but that's her loss. All right. So that's what we're doing. You can't come up with any image that accurately represents God or His holiness. Can what about this? Somebody's going to ask the question. What about the images in the temple? You got the Ark of the Covenant. You got these cherubim. These, you know, familiar with that. You know what? Uh, you've seen the movie. Familiar with that? You got the bronze serpent. These images are things that are created. And so you can make images, but you can't worship them. These have a purpose, but the cherubim on the ark are not to be worshipped. The ark of the covenant itself is not to be worshipped. The bronze serpent had a meaning, but it wasn't to be worshipped. But after it started being worshipped, it had to be destroyed. So then somebody's going to ask me, I've got a picture of Jesus in my house. Am I going to hell? I'll say no. Are you bowing down to the picture and worshiping it? Don't do that. But it's okay to have a picture of Jesus. You know, we don't know if that was what he really looked like. I know people think they do, but we know we don't. He goes on to say in this same uh, uh, section of scripture right here, God says that I, I'm a jealous God. And that's not a petty type of jealousy. The Hebrew word there actually means red faced. I'm a red-faced God. And he's, what, the reason that is, is he has so much invested in his people that he's pained when they or we show loyalty, allegiance, or love which should be directed towards him to anyone else. It's actually, um, the analogy is to marriage. That's the type of jealousy it is. You know, all right? Some people say, well, it's not healthy to be jealous. I trust my wife beyond whatever measurement is. Because my thinking is, she's got me. Who else could compare? (laughs) 
That's the way I look at it. I don't think she looks at it that way. But the point is, point is, I would be, and I'm, I'm really not a jealous soul, but if she started showing attention to somebody, I would get jealous. Why? Because I've got so much invested in her. And I don't mean money. I mean 30 years of history with this woman that I love, that I live with. We have children together. All that sort of thing. I, yes. And I grant you, gentlemen, you would be the same way. And ladies, the same thing if, if, if that would happen. Be jealous. And that's what, it, that's what we're talking about here. It likens it to the marriage relationship. I'm not talking about the jealous that some guy walks up and starts talking to your wife and all of a sudden you want to fight. I'm not talking about that. It's not a petty type of jealousy, but it does have uh, a reference to spousal type of jealousy. I, am, I get red-faced when the love God is saying, when the love that is to be given to me is given to some other little G God. He's not jealous about the love I give to my wife or vice versa or anybody else. In it. It's not that. All these relationships have a hierarchy and have a place to fit. But he said, I get red-faced. Why? Why does, he get red Why does it bother me that much? Because he, I am the one that delivered you. And because I am the only true God. There's nobody else worth worshiping. Nobody else can deliver you. Nobody else can do this. Nobody else can bring you into this world. Therefore, I am logically, he, God is saying, I'm the only one who is deserving of this type of love. And he goes on to say this next thing about visiting. Let me go back to the exact wording of it. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. Now, I haven't dealt with this since I've moved to Georgia. I got a feeling if I moved out in, in the sticks, I would deal with it. Because I, I dealt with it back home in Mississippi. This thing called generational curses tends to run in Pentecostal circles. And it kind of works like this. So and so in the family, Uncle Fred is a total loser or he killed somebody, or he beat his wife and children, or something like that. And because of that sin, his family has now been cursed down to three or four, third or fourth generation. And maybe a, a nephew, a grandson, or something like that, he's having a hard time. Just can't find his way, what have you the case may be. And you hear this, oh, uh, I'm being punished. Or maybe you lose your job, or your car explodes, or something like that. And now I'm being punished because of what Uncle Fred did. That's crazy. It sounds like voodoo. All of a sudden in the Bible, it's a generational curse. Down to the third and fourth generation, we've got to have three or four more litters of kids to get this thing out of our system. Problem is, if the kids go bad, then what are you going to do? you got three or four more generations. I mean, it just keeps building. But it's ludicrous. First of all, you've got to, and I used to sit under a pastor that, would, that taught this kind of stuff. And I never agreed with it. And I always asked him, I said, what do you do with the last part of that verse? What? Where it says, I show mercy to those that love me. I mean, it kind of makes sense. If somebody just hates God, well, then there's something going wrong. But then he says, hey, those that love me, I show mercy to them. I said, what do you do with that B portion of the verse? Never wanted to talk about that. But it's, it's, it's not reading something in its context. I'll say this, there are immediate, there are consequences to our sin. If I go out and rob a liquor store and get caught, go to jail, I'm going to pay a price for it. My wife's going to pay a price because of the stigma. There's going to be a loss of income. There are going to be all sorts of issues. My children are going to pay a price because, yeah, that's the kid, that's the pastor's kid, the pastor robbed a liquor store and shot up so-and-so and all this kind of junk. Um, there, there's going to be a stigma. There are going to be prices to that. Anything we do like that, that, sin, we pay a price for it. And our families pay a price for it. It has a ripple effect, but it has nothing to do. Or say it doesn't affect in such a way your eternal destiny. All right? Not if you're saved. There's no sort of voodoo curse or stigma out there that can overpower the gospel. And that's what God is saying here. Yeah, there can be an immediate thing. You lose a job. Oh, no, I'm being cursed. No, you didn't. You, the company moved or something. And that makes hard times for you. But that doesn't mean there's a generational curse. You're going to, are you going to pay a price for that? Yeah, it's going to be hard to find a job, what have you. But the point is, God still loves you. I think we'll talk about Daniel here in a second. 
I want to go to Lamentations 5-7 because this actual, reading this verse in the Ten Commandments here, actually created a superstition amongst the Israelites. And we see it here in Lamentations 5-7. It says, Our fathers sinned and are no more, but we bear their iniquities. That verse is often used to support the idea of general, generational cursing. I want to take Daniel the prophet, for instance. His countrymen, his forefathers, sinned and God, they were exiled from the land, of the, from the promised land, and now... Daniel, all these decades later, is sitting over in Babylon. Is he bearing the brunt for something that his forefathers did? Yes. Yes. But it's not because of something Daniel did. It's something else. But here's the deal. Is he bearing the brunt of something that happened? Yes. But it does not affect his salvation. He's not being cursed like that. It is the natural outworking of something that someone did before you. And that works to the good or the bad. We are in what I argue is the greatest country in the world, as jacked up as it is. If you've been anywhere else, I still believe this is the greatest country in the world. Why are we here, all of us, depending on where we're from, or generations back? Because of something someone else did, whether that was good or bad. We're here. But God still is able to reach down and pick out the sheep from the goats. He's still able to use Daniel, though he's in exile, because of something someone else did. But the exile is not his salvation. It doesn't, it's not his eternal destiny. It is his situation and circumstance. That might have to do with the stigma or some other action, but not his eternal destiny. So this verse, Lamentations 5-7, is often used to support this idea of generational curses. And you see this. Look at Jeremiah 31, verses 29 and 30. In those days they shall say no more. And this is like a proverb here. The fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. Which is essentially saying our fathers did something. It's, our teeth are set on edge. Like when my kid, when Trey was little, I liked when we go to a restaurant, he'd put anything in his mouth. So my buddy and I, he, they had a little kid. What do you do? You give them the lemon out of the teeth. And they go, and then the, you watch them do this. It was fun. I got in trouble. Robin would have slapped my hand for it. But it's, you know. You think the kid will eventually learn. Don't just put anything in your mouth. He's hard-headed. But that's what they're talking about here. Our fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. The fathers did something, but we're feeling the effects of it. Verse 30, But everyone shall die for his own iniquity. Every man who eats the sour grapes, his teeth shall be set on edge. And that's a declarative. God is saying here, this garbage about generational curses that you have made into a superstition is bogus. And you look at Ezekiel 18, word, uh, verses 1 through 4. The word of the Lord came to me again saying, What do you mean when you use this? And this is, God's asking this. What are y'all talking about? Have you lost your minds? That's the nice way of see, saying this. What do you mean when you use this proverb concerning the land of Israel saying, The fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. As I live, says the Lord God, you shall no longer use this proverb in Israel. Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the father as well as the soul of the son is mine. The soul who sins shall die. He's saying it comes down to you. Not what your parents did. It's an individual thing. And that carries over in to this day. If you actually look at the law, it's illegal in the law, the code in Leviticus or in Deuteronomy, for, for my child to be punished for something I did. So that superstition, and that's how dogma gets started. All of a sudden, after a bunch of people say it, it must be true. I saw it on the Internet. We know everything's true that's on the Internet. How do you know that? Because I saw it on the Internet. That's what is at work here. You've got to say, no, 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 no. This comes down to individuals. Ezekiel here attacks, attacks this very idea. There's, once again, there's no amount of voodoo or family culture that can overwhelm the gospel. God can still sort out the sheep from the goats. He knows and has numbered every hair on your head. And some of y'all have made that job very easy for him. Verse 7. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. And this goat, now in our culture where I grew up, that is saying the GD word. Just taking the Lord's name. Or even you can't say, oh God. Which I don't 
advocate saying that. You say even even goodness is actually a cognate of the Anglo-Saxon word God, which means good. So you're doing a circle there. You know, but you, but you gotta look. You gotta have something to say. You know, you gotta have a word. You know, bust your knuckles. You gotta say something. It doesn't need to be a bad word, but you gotta you gotta say. A lot, a lot of people, Pentecost folks, go. They'll break their hand and go, "Bless it, Lord, bless it." I'm rejoicing. In this tribulation, that's sort of, I think that's over the top. But the point is, we think, or I was raised to think, that taking the Lord's name in vain is saying bad words. It goes way, way beyond that. The word translated take means to carry, and that totally changes things. We are not to carry the name of the Lord in vain, which means uselessly or flippantly. You don't carry the name. Why would you carry it anyway? Because he's your God, which means what? He has delivered you. And he's the only true God that is supposed to be worshipped in a certain way with no graven images or anything else. You don't carry that name flippantly or, or uselessly. You don't bear it. You don't represent it in a useless or flippant way. Now what does that translate to? That means a lot of stuff. You don't go say you're a Christian and then the next word idea is blankety, blankety, blank, blank. We got video of you on YouTube Drunk, brawling, chasing women, and all that other kind of stuff. And there's a lot more that could be. I'm just, you know, that sort of thing. You get the picture. How do you carry the name? Do people at work know you're a Christian? Do you claim it? Or are you one of those secret agent Christians? I don't want them to know because I behave so badly. Well, then straighten up. Because you have a vocation, which is to reflect the holiness of God. There's a, an analogy for you. A lot of us, or a lot of people have uh, jobs and you have the name of the company on your shirt, polo shirt or something, name tag, something. And if you go off wearing that shirt, acting a fool, what do you do? You besmirch the reputation of the company for whom you work. It's the same thing. If I'm going to carry the name of God, if I'm going to carry the badge of Christian, then the walk and the talk have to match. That is what taking the name of the Lord God in vain means. I'm not accurately representing the holiness of God to the people to whom I'm supposed to be representing His holiness. I take it flippantly. It's not a big deal. Yeah, I go to church, but everything out of my house is a blankety, blankety, blank. I'm, I'm harassing women and children and and shooting at people on the road, and, and my neighbors, I burnt down their she shed, and, and all this kind of stuff. I'm not accurate. That's not accurately representing God. That is what the commandment means. Because it would denigrate the name of the entity that I carry, which is God, the holy God of Israel that has delivered me. Has the meaning of the memorial faded? Or have we become so familiar with it that it's faded? Verse 8. i got to rock and roll here. We're running out of time. Jacob's going to shoot me. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor the, your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days, we link it back to creation here. This is important. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Now I'm constantly talking about ancient Near Eastern context. Y'all know that. I'll beat that horse and I will continue to beat it. That's because there's so many parallels in those other cultures that actually give us some color commentary on what we're reading in the Bible. But there is no parallel in any nation to Israel's Sabbath. Do they use cycles of sevens and stuff like that? Yeah, in different ways. But nobody else has a Sabbath. The Assyrians don't have a Sabbath. The Canaanites don't have a Sabbath. The Egyptians don't have a Sabbath. The Philistines don't have a Sabbath. The Amorites, Ammonites, Hivites, or any of the other ites, none of them have a Sabbath. There's only one people that had a Sabbath. And that is Israel. Now we don't celebrate the Sabbath. This is not the Sabbath. Sunday is not the Sabbath. Sunday is not the Christian Sabbath. 
Because we're told what the Sabbath commemorates. And we commemorate several, several things. In Deuteronomy, I think it's 515, it commemorates the Exodus. All right, so that's for Israel. We don't have the Sabbath. When Jesus is asked about the commandments, he lists two. Love your God with all your heart, which essentially wraps up the first four commandments, and love your neighbor as yourself, which wraps up the six. Jesus doesn't mention the Sabbath. We go to church, we worship on the first day of the week because we commemorate our memorial is to the resurrection of Jesus, not the being brought out of Israel uh, of Egypt. Do you understand? The, the Israelites did that. So we don't celebrate the Sabbath. This is not our Sabbath. Don't say that. Quit. Stop. It's not our Sabbath. When I was a kid, you know, they had blue laws. And, only, and that meant that only certain businesses could be open on Sunday. I know uh, grocery stores could be open. But I don't think restaurants could be open. I don't, anybody, I don't remember what all the rules were. I was a kid when they changed it. I remember it was a big deal. Why? Because you didn't want to violate the Sabbath. That's a total misunderstanding of what the Sabbath is. What is the Sabbath? The first mentioning of the word Sabbath was in Exodus 16. But, you, but it links back in verse 11 there to the creation where God ceased or rested on the seventh day. So what is that context? What does that mean to them? Well, God ceased his work. And so we rest. All right, that, that's, that's what it's always been taught. But there's more to it than that. Yes, it was a day of rest for them. But in that day, this is some of that groovy, geeky stuff that I like. When God, after the sixth day of creation, when he rested, and what you see in the other culture of the ancient Near East, is when a king or a god rested, it was when he was through doing something. And at the time he, he enters his rest, he sits on his throne in order to look out over all he surveys and enjoy, the, enjoy what he sees. And so God created the world and then he ceased from, from his creative acts and then he sits down and he enjoys his creation. Kind of like after you cut the grass, you sit on the porch and look at it. After you've done something around the house, yeah painted the house. You sit back and look at it. That's what's going on here. But it was a time for communing. And what? That, why do they have the Sabbath? So that they can rest. And they are invited into sitting down and looking and uh, meditating, as it were, on this new creation. And you do it with God. The rest always in those ancient cultures includes time with God. Being invited into this time with God so that it's holy and it's linked back to creation. They are a new creation. You start putting all that together, and you see what the Sabbath really meant. Okay, I'm trying to blow through this right quick. Anyway, all right, we built a foundation, and those things uh, stack on top of each other. Because God delivered Israel, proving himself to be the only creator, the only uncreated being, he is the only one worthy of their worship and ours. Because of this deliverance, their deliverance from Egypt, our deliverance from sin and bondage, there are to be no other little g-gods before him. And we cannot liken him to anything that is created since he is above his creation. There's just nothing that he's created that gets close to him. It's a bogus picture. It's half a picture. I mean, what if you think every, uh, every picture in your now your phone or your photo album is only... This side. And I've seen people who take pictures like that. But it's only this, or only a part of it. Took a picture of, of your husband and wife and you see this. What good is that? It doesn't give you any idea. And you can't have that idea. It's just God is so above his creation, but he's still actively involved and invested and jealous over his creation because of the love he has for us. That's why he went through all the trouble of the deliverance. That's why Jesus had to go through all that he went through in order to deliver us. And because of all of this, that he, all that he's done, that memorial is, we carry his name to others and bear it in a manner that is consistent with his character. We have to represent him accurately. Any, P, any of us that have a job, you know what you're supposed to do when you show up at the customer's place of business. 
Well, we, we provide insurance in the amount of $100,000. Well, you can't just go tell them, hey, for $5 a month, I give you $3 million worth of insurance. It doesn't matter if you're smoking 18 packs of cigarettes a day and eating, you know, and drinking all of that. It, that. That is misrepresenting the issue. We can't misrepresent God because now you understand, take, put this together with the Sabbath, the ultimate rest of sitting back and enjoying the new creation for us Christians is now with what Jesus has done and how now the Holy Spirit resides within us. Now think about that. If the tabernacle and the temple are where God resides, now God, the Holy Spirit, He resides in us. And so we take Him, not just His name, He is with us. How do we represent that to the world? And we don't do it because... He's beat it into us or because He's guilted us into us, guilted it into us. Do it because why? Because if we honestly remember the memorial in the way it should be, because He's delivered us from bondage. Now unfortunately, we, did, we live in a day where people don't look at sin as a big deal. Schindler was loved because of his compassion for the Jews and the others who were being sent to their deaths. Like I said, people today tend to not look at sin as being sent to death, but it is actually that very thing. Only we send ourselves. God delivered Israel in the Exodus, and Jesus did, did that same sort of deliverance for the entire world. For all who believe at the cross and in His resurrection, the same type of deliverance has been done. These commandments, because this always gets messed up too, these commandments weren't given as a checklist in order, merit, in order to merit God's favor or salvation because God will never be in our debt. You understand that? He's too high. I don't care if you go feed all the homeless children in the world, clothe all the homeless people and all that. You're still, God will never be in our debt. We are in His debt. But the obedience to these commandments... They don't acquire salvation. Rather, they were, in their case, or in our, uh, our instance, the obedience to God's word. I'm talking about the law. These are, that what this is, the obedience factor, the works thing that people get all spooled up about, it's not a prerequisite to salvation. It does not merit salvation. It's actually a demonstration of something that is believed. Abraham, when God made that covenant with him, Abraham does have some, something to do in that. God walked between the animals back in Genesis 12, Genesis 15. Yeah, and in that sense, it's unconditional. But what does Abraham have to do? He has to believe. He has to be circumcised. That's not a work to obtain salvation. It is an act that proves that I believe. Abraham can't just go, No, Lord, I'm an older guy now. That's going to hurt. Don't think so. He can't take Isaac up on a mountain and gaze like, God, you know, I'm, I just can't. Sorry. See you later. He can't not do those things and still be in covenant. But those things are really, why did Abraham do them? Because he believed. He had faith. Those are just a demonstration of what he believed. When we do works, it's just a demonstration of what we believe. And if we're not doing the right thing, conversely, what does it demonstrate? I'm not taking these things as seriously as we are. There's a lack of faith there. God had already delivered Israel when these commandments were given. They're already His people. They're already in the house. They're already in the family. And it works the same for us today. Our lives don't change because we want to be delivered. They are changed because we have been delivered. Through faith, we believe that Jesus purchased eternal life for us. And because of what He has done for us, because He's the only one worthy of being worshipped. He's the only one that could create the world. Because of what He's done for us, our lives are changed in order that we show the world what we believe. So the talk and the walk have to match. But it's all because of what's already been done. Would you all bow your heads, please? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank You for what You've done. It's not about what we've done. We simply believe. It's about what you've done. How you've purchased our salvation. Lord, how you delivered Israel and how through Jesus you've delivered all of us, all the nations.
All of us Gentiles here on the far side of the world, you delivered all of us. It's all about that. Lord, please not let us not confuse works and salvation or, or fruit in salvation or anything else. Please let us see that the loyalty and the faith comes because of what you've done. You always initiate the relationship. And if the plan is going to work, you have to carry it. So thank you, Lord God, for initiating the plan. Thank you, Lord God, for saving our souls. Thank you, Father, for making a way for sinners like us to be seen as holy in your eyes. And that's only through the blood of Jesus. And that is the thing for which we're most thankful, Lord. And I pray that the memorial whether it's the communion, the fact that we come to church, or anything else that, we've, that you've done in our lives that we kind of put a marker or hung a flag on, Lord. I pray that those things never fade because we've forgotten, and I pray, Father, that they never fade because we've come so from, become so familiar with them. Lord, let's keep it in the proper context. And thank you once again for Jesus. In his name I pray, amen.